welcome to The Public's Health, a product of the Alameda County Public Health Department. This is the show that puts the public back in public health. I'm Dr. Tony Eiten, your host, and the Alameda County Health Officer. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that is very, very important and very, very interesting. We have a panel of excellent guests that's going to allow us to get some real insights into this important disease, asthma. My three guests today have graciously um, volunteered their time to tell us all we need to know about asthma. Joel Irvis is uh, with RAMP, the Regional Asthma Management and Prevention um, Group. And Mindy Benson is with Children's Hospital, uh, their asthma program. And Margaret Gordon is with uh, the West Oakland Toxics Coalition and um, has a long history of being very active in the West Oakland community around environmental justice issues. Before we get to our guests, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the broader topic of adolescent health and see from our um, community what's going on that's creative around getting youth and adolescents involved in their own health and taking ownership of that. This is the Berkeley High School Health and Wellness Fair. It's um, hosted by a lot of different groups from all over the Bay Area, anybody who has to do with health and wellness. My group, Passion, has two booths, one for sexual health and one for drunk driving. So it's a really big fair that we have at Berkeley High School every year. Uh, it's my first year, but it's a really great job and I love it. The Adolescent Health Conference is a conference from youth and for adults, anybody who's involved with health and wellness and education in the Bay, well, from all over California. Hopefully there will be about 100 youth at the conference. There is a youth track. The youth track is specifically for the peer health educators themselves. In past years it's just been coordinators from programs and I really like that the youth can be involved in their own studies. There are so many different workshops that peer educators are bringing in. There's some about violence and then there's some that pertain specifically to men or to women and violence in the community. Health rights is a youth issue because Everybody, as a teenager, you have to deal with so many things and so many pressures, and health rights are really important to teens and knowing how to handle themselves in those kind of situations. My personal commitment to the program is really strong. I really feel that teens need to have a voice in their health and their rights, and so I want to help out in any way that I can. The Adolescent Health Conference is happening this year on May 18th and 19th at Preservation Park. Um, it's a two-day conference, all day Thursday and Friday. This year's conference theme is Health Rights for Teens, and the purpose is to gain some momentum as we go into an election year around the different health rights and the disparities facing youth, specifically youth of color, youth in under-resourced communities, and getting their issues heard. Our goals are to have a successful conference, to have a statewide turnout, to have a town hall at the end of the conference where we can actually organize around upcoming issues. Uh, we want to provide a resource DVD for everyone at the conference so that they leave with icebreakers, with their contact information of other organizations and tools. There's a lot of health issues that face youth today. Um, I think the big ones are getting comprehensive sex education to them that's factual and that is presented in a way that makes that they can present it to each other so it makes the most sense. For anyone who wants to be involved with the conference, they should call Cornelius Quinn at Hi-Fi, 415 274 1970 extension 32. Or they can go to CaliforniaTeenHealth.org. And we're back. Uh, we're going to return to the topic of adolescent health in a future show, but one of the key diseases that affects many adolescents, particularly in some of our urban communities, is asthma. And as I said, we have a wonderful panel today, and let's not waste any time and get to them. Mindy Benson, Children's Hospital has been very involved in asthma, both in the treatment and prevention side and the, and the public communication and education side. What is asthma? Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think it's important for the public to understand that our, underst our understanding, the medical community's understanding of asthma dramatically changed in the late 80s, early 90s. Prior to that, we thought asthma was just a disease of 
the muscles that were on the outsides of our breathing tubes um, and we understood it to be um, a disease of the muscles squeezing down and causing difficulty breathing in that way. And in the late 80s, early 90s, we really, the science became much more sophisticated and we really now understand asthma as a disease of inflammation. That is the main thing that's going on. Like so many diseases, it starts with inflammation. And this inflammation um, not only clogs up the breathing tubes, but actually makes these muscles on the outside of the breathing tubes very sensitive. So just a small trigger might cause these muscles to squeeze down. So really asthma is two things. It's inflammation on the inside of the breathing tubes and it's the muscles that then squeeze down and make it hard to breathe. Oh, very interesting. So given this new knowledge about the underlying causes and the pathophysiology or what's happening in the bronchial tubes, how has the medication approach to asthma changed? Oh, it's a huge difference from what we used to do. We used to manage the symptoms of asthma, and now we know how to prevent asthma. The problem with um, the new way of doing things is that in order to prevent asthma, we really need our families who have children or they have asthma themselves for adults to take medicines every day even when they feel well. Many, many asthmatics have what we call persistent asthma, which is this inflammation that I spoke about a moment ago. And that requires a daily medicine to prevent that inflammation from coming on in the first place, which is different than just taking something to relax those muscles on the outside of the breathing tubes, which is all we had prior to the um, early 90s. I've heard that many doctors still treat asthma just with the medicines that relax the, the muscles. Mm -hmm. And many families still consider those medications to be the staple of their treatment. Is there a problem with that? Yeah, there is a problem with that. Um, the good thing about those, those medicines that make the muscles relax is that in the short term they help people breathe better. But the problem is that they don't really do anything for this inflammation, which is the cause of those muscles squeezing down in the first place. So we are sort of putting on a, a Band-Aid on something that might need stitches. <laughs> it doesn't really solve the problem. Now, does that inflammation get worse over time if it goes untreated? The inflammation can get worse. Asthma is a disease of variability, so somebody might have what we call severe asthma in the winter, but maybe it's more moderate or mild in the spring or the summer. So asthma can vary. And, and certainly, um, if we leave inflammation untreated, we know that damage can happen to the breathing tubes, permanent damage, scarring to the insides of the breathing tubes as a result of chronic inflammation. Wow. Yeah. Joel, tell us a little bit about the data, the epidemiology of asthma. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk a bit more about uh, the disease. Um, the overall trends for asthma on a national level um, indicate that uh, asthma as a disease is on the rise. We know, for example, that self-reported prevalence of asthma, sort of how common the disease is, has increased by about 76% just over the past 20 years or so. Um, here in Alameda County, we know that about one in eight people has been diagnosed with the disease. In children, it's actually worse. Uh, it's about one in seven has been diagnosed with asthma. And remember, that's an average number. So in some communities, it's gonna be much more prevalent. Um, we know if, yeah, there are certain classrooms in this county, for example, where one in five kids will have asthma. Wow. One in four kids. So if you're, if you're thinking about a classroom of say 35 students, if seven of those kids have asthma, they may be having a hard time breathing when really they should be having a hard time with their math pro problems or their English paper. So it really is a widespread disease. Hopefully they're getting the math and the breathing. Right? <laughs> Hopefully they're getting the math and the breathing right. Well, why is it increasing? What, what, what is the thought, the thinking behind why this epidemic is increasing? Sure, there are a couple different factors. One is that I think um, the, uh, we're now better able to diagnose it. Just as an issue, there's a lot more awareness about it. Doctors are better trained about it now. So there's that, but even that higher levels of awareness don't fully account for the increase. So in some cases, it can have something to do with increased exposure to environmental contaminants, whether it's outside in the air that we're breathing or inside the home from something uh, coming from within the home. 
So there are really a variety of factors that are at play. Well, wow, that's a little bit frightening. How, how do you how do you make people feel at ease about this? What 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 are the what's the good news? So the good news is that there there are solutions to asthma, and uh, Mindy spoke about a couple of them in terms of the clinical management. And really, asthma as a disease, in terms of both the treatment of it and the prevention of asthma, it requires comprehensive solutions that go from clinical management, so good quality care with working with your doctor to make sure that you're taking the right meds to also good environmental prevention. And really, a lot of this falls in the lap of our policymakers and those who have decisions about our environment, about uh, the conditions of our schools, et cetera. Because we, we have to be sure that not only are people taking the proper meds, but also aren't being exposed to um, external factors that they have little control over. Wow, so this is a complex solution for a complex disease. Exactly. Now. You mentioned policymakers. What are some of the innovative strategies that policymakers have been employing to help us combat this rising epidemic of asthma? Sure. There are so many different examples. You can look at what's happened in the, the realm of outdoor air quality. There's a lot of work happening at the state level, but also here in the Bay Area, to uh, decrease, for example, emissions from diesel buses or from trucks that visit the port. Margaret will have a lot to say about that, I'm hoping, uh, later in the program. The um, school districts are working to be sure that, the, that when a custodian goes through and cleans a classroom that uh, he or she is also looking at some of the environmental triggers, whether it's um, excess dust or if there's a mold problem that that problem is taken care of. Um, again, we need a comprehensive policy approach. It's not just a, a one-time fix, but we have to be sure that these um, environmental triggers are reduced over time. Well, one of the things that we see in asthma is that families find this sometimes an overwhelming disease, confusing, the medications are somewhat complex, some of them are expensive, and it requires on occasion that nurses actually go out into the homes like Mindy and explain to the families how to use the medications, what sorts of triggers may exist in the home. And we've got a short clip for you here of one of our Alameda County Public Health Department uh, employees going out in, in our Asthma Start program, doing a home visit, and a wonderful family and a cute kid, and we're sure you're going to enjoy it. Hi, my name is Julie Mills, and I'm a social worker in the Alameda County Public Health Department Asthma Start program. I work with children with asthma and their families in their homes. The goal of our program is to educate the families about asthma and get the child's asthma under control. I start by showing them these bronchial models and other pictures so they can understand what's happening in the lungs during an asthma attack, how the asthma is actually affecting the lungs. So I use these bronchial models to show a normal lung the, inside the bronchial tubes, how the airway is big and can allow for easy breathing versus when a child's having problems with asthma, they can see the inflammation and swelling and all of the phlegm and also the, the muscle out here constricts and causes them to have trouble breathing. And then I have them show me the medications that their child is using so I can explain to them how the medications work in the lungs. I hope that once they understand how the medications are working, they'll be more inclined to take them correctly and regularly as prescribed. There's two main kinds of medication, one that treats the immediate symptoms and one that prevents the asthma attacks and helps to get it under control. So I go over the different warning signs for the families to look for, the symptoms that a child might have so they'll know when to give the various medications. I also make sure they understand the symptoms that are serious enough that they need to take the child to the hospital so they'll know when to go. I also observe the child taking their medications because there's most of the medications are different kinds of inhalers and they need to be taken in different ways. So often I find that the children are not taking the medications correctly, so I wanna make sure that they know how to take it properly so the medication can be effective. Then we talk about triggers that could make the child's asthma worse and trigger an attack. We actually walk through the home to look for triggers and some are things that we just talk about. So the various triggers include things like smoke and secondhand smoke, dust and dust mites, mold, furred and feathered animals, cockroaches and rodents, 
allergens including things like pollen or grass or different trees and some foods anything with a strong scent that you could smell could enter into the lungs and irritate them and different chemicals um, having a cold or the flu can be a trigger as well as cold weather or changes in the weather and also for some people really hot weather is a trigger exercise is also another trigger although we do encourage everyone to exercise and we just teach the families of how to work with that and still avoid asthma attacks. Um, pollution is another thing that can be a trigger, as well as some people have jobs, for example, a construction job where they can bring home dust and dirt on their clothes can affect the asthma. Often we also work with the doctors to help as a teen to get the asthma under control. And usually we work with the families for about three months and three visits. And once the asthma is under control, then we close the case but we're still always available by phone if the families have further questions or problems. If you have any questions or about asthma, you can call us at 510-383-5181. Thank you. One child at a time, one family at a time. The, the work of educating families about asthma is laborious, but it's important as people need to understand how to use the medications and how to create an environment that's safe for kids with asthma. I have asthma and two of our three guests also have asthma. And one of the things we know is that in certain communities, uh, particularly low-income communities with lots of African Americans in particular and Latinos, the rates of asthma can be astoundingly high. One of our guests, Margaret Gordon, is an expert in West Oakland and some of the environmental issues that are ongoing there and we'd like to hear from her and hear the expertise from the streets about West Oakland. Margaret. Thank you, Tony, for having me here. Um, I am a resident of West Oakland. I've been there for 14 years. I've been doing um, environmental justice work for about the last 10 years. And, and my expertise of finding out the sources of, of air pollution and asthma has been related to the port. I live less than a mile away. The port has, uh, on the average, between the three freeways that make up West Oakland, anywhere from 12 to 14,000 trips, truck trips a day. That's a lot of trucks in the neighborhood. That's not including the ships that's coming in, the cranes that are operating. That's not including the air cargo um, that's, that's moving in and out of, of the airport. But we are inundated within West Oakland by diesel. And by having diesel, um, as I have learned over the years, that diesel can trigger asthma attack. And so being that close proximity to that kind of activity of the port, community is just accessible to uh, that poor outdoor air quality. Wow, the Port of Oakland is the fourth biggest port in the country and 12 to 14,000 truck trips a day. That's astounding. So the burden of diesel pollution that falls on West Oakland probably contributes in some degree to the disproportionate amount of asthma in that community. Now you've been very active in the environmental justice movement. What approaches have you been using in West Oakland to try to redress this, this injustice? Well, one of the things we have done is we have worked on to rerouting the trucks out of the neighborhood for parking. We have also worked and get doing a lot of indoor air studies and so we could un understand the, the, the diesel spikes, what time of the year that is really high uh, within West Oakland. We also have been working on the issue of land, where, um, where is the port um, uh, supporting the truckers to be parked in West Oakland. As of today, the truckers have no place to really depart, they park. Uh, they park about anywhere. And also, we've also been engaging the Port of Oakland based on their goods movement. And what's happened about the goods movement is that that's a larger, um, a more import and export of goods coming from uh, the Far East that's going to be coming, or China that's going to be coming to the Port of Oakland. And with that, there's going to be more trucks, more air cargo, more and deeper, wider ships more air cargo, more railroad. It's going to be just more inundation. So we're right now in the middle of 
identifying these things. What are the new technologies out there? What are the new um, um, fuels that can be, uh, port can be utilized to reduce pollution in West Oakland? Wow. So, and I know you've been working with some groups in West Oakland to look specifically at some of these technologies. How much do you feel technologies, new technologies, are part of the solution to this problem? And how much do you think it's just good old-fashioned organizing and getting the community to demand that these truck routes be rerouted and that the port take more responsibility for the, the burden of disease that these trucks are causing in West it's Oakland? It's all of it. All you, of can't, you, can't, you just cannot separate it. You have, to be, you have to be vigilant and you have to be consistent with all doing all those activities at the same time. Because if you, because if you stop on one, then something else will happen on another. So you have to constantly have and be having the, uh, um, the places and the space to be able to address those issues with all parties. And right now, those things are happening within, within West Oakland. We're addressing those things. We are constantly looking, researching uh, within my organizations, with other organizations, um, national organizations, to look at how we can reduce the air pollution and have better air quality in West Oakland. Good for you. So it's a comprehensive approach that you're all engaging in in West Oakland to take on this issue. Oh, yes, we have to. Because if you, like I said, if you miss one thing, then something else is going to happen, mm -hmm. and you and you spend, and then you have to regroup yourself to even to have it. So you have to have this, you have to regroup yourself to be able to uh, to start that engagement. So what we have done is this multiple prong co comprehensive look at about air pollution, and so we have to be very vigilant and have a very balanced uh, coordination of being able to address all those issues. Now, a lot of the families in West Oakland are low income. <clears throat> Many of them live in housing that they don't own. They may be renters or living with other family. Some of the housing is not in such good shape. You mentioned earlier indoor air and the issue of the actual pollutants that people may be breathing actually inside their houses, never mind outside um, when they're exposed to the diesel and all of the other um, external pollutants. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, for infant, or for a fact, my, my home that I live in, I've had my house t indoor tested twice. And from the testing, we found that the pollution from diesel does come into the house. And we also find out that uh, West Oakland um, air quality for inside is five times more higher than other parts of Oakland, based on because we're so close to the, to the port. We also found out that most of the older housing in West Oakland do not have helper sy systems, whereas the air, the, the diesel or whatever pollutants in the air can be filtered out. Those kind of things do not happen in West Oakland. So people need to either have to be educated around the use of having better indoor air quality or being able to buy those, uh, those uh, devices that support that to better have in, indoor air, better indoor in, air quality. Or we have to, uh, address any all the housing, all the housing stock in West Oakland has to be much better, so that you do have a better quality of air inside. Wow! So this is a big task. This is a uh, it's a lot of work to be done here. Mindy Benson, how does Children's Hospital Oakland handle uninsured kids who have all of these issues to contend with, mm -hmm. lacking health insurance, low income? Some of these medications are very expensive. Mm -hmm and maybe not a lot of education around asthma and prevention. And of course, a whole host of other social issues that may be higher priorities in their day-to-day -day existence. Well, at Children's Hospital, um, we see children in so many different departments. They come into our emergency room um, by the droves. Probably 4,000 kids a year come through our emergency room, and about half of them are sent on to stay overnight in the hospital for um, fairly serious asthma attacks where they need to have um, regular treatments that are sometimes going for 24 hours a day and an IV. And uh, we also see them in our outpatient clinics and our pulmonary department. So they come to Children's Hospital in many, many different ways. And unfortunately, um, we have a somewhat sophisticated program where we're trying to do education for the families in the hospital, in the clinic, in the emergency room, we now have asthma coordinators 
that help do some education right on site, and then we refer to, to um, the Asthma Start program, as you mentioned before, and Julie Mills and, and other asthma coordinators in the community to go out into people's homes and help them with the triggers in the home. So really what we do is we're just a member of the team in our in Oakland and in the sort of um, Oakland Berkeley area the Alameda County area um, we're one member of the team that really has to work together I mean you, you heard all these things that Margaret had to say there's no way any one organization is going to handle this huge huge of a task of, of managing asthma um, but we do have a wonderful coalition um, called OBAC the Oakland Berkeley Asthma Coalition that brings together people to work on policy, education, and health care. And it really feels like a true partnership when so many organizations come together to work on these things. Joel, tell us about RAMP. It's a unique organization. Can you give us a 30-second description of what RAMP is and maybe your website? Sure. Uh, RAMP is a regional collaborative that works to reduce the burden of asthma here in the Bay Area. And um, one of the ways that we do that is to essentially help facilitate a lot of the community-based uh, collaboratives that Mindy mentioned. So we'll provide assistance to local coalitions both here in Alameda County and uh, throughout uh, the Bay Area so that they can work together uh, more effectively in a comprehensive way that looks at asthma. Our website is www.rampasthma.org. One more time. www.rampasthma.org. And if you are, in fact, interested in finding a local coalition, you can find one through that website. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So um, we hope you've enjoyed our show about asthma. Stay tuned. In the coming future, we'll be talking about pandemic influenza. I'd like to thank all of our guests for being here and our guests that were on the uh, video clips. Um, we've got a wonderful group working here in the Alameda County area, and we hope you'll take advantage of these resources. Have a great day.